Today's reading is taken from Genesis chapter 49, verses 1 to 28, starting on page 55 of your Bibles, and chapter 50, verses 15 to 21 on page 57. Before we start the reading, let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for giving us your word. We pray that as we listen, we will remember that as Jacob knew his sons, you know us to our core. You know our thoughts, our needs, and the secrets of our hearts before we ask. Help us to accept your vision for our lives. In your name, amen. Then Jacob call, called for his sons and said, Gather round so that I can tell you what will happen to you in days to come. Assemble and listen, sons of Jacob. Listen to your father Israel. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the first sign of my strength, excelling in honor, excelling in power. Turbulent as the waters, you will no longer excel. For you went up onto your father's bed, onto my couch, and defiled it. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. Let me not enter their council. Let me not join their assembly. For they have killed men in their anger and hamstrung oxen as they please. Cursed be their anger so fierce and their fury so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, Judah. You return, <coughs> excuse me, you return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down like a lioness. Who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. Zebulun will live by the seashore and become a haven for ships. His border will extend towards Sidon. Issachar is a scrawny donkey lying down among the sheepfolds. When he sees how good is his resting place and how pleasant is his land, he will bend his shoulder to the burden and submit to forced labor. Dan will provide justice for his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan will be a snake by the roadside, a viper along the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider tumbles backwards. I look for your deliverance, Lord. Gad will be attacked by a band of raiders, but he will attack them at their heels. Asher's food will be rich. He will provide delicacies fit for a king. Naphtali is a doe set free that bears beautiful fawns. Joseph is a fruitful vine, a fruitful vine near a spring whose branches climb over a wall. With bitterness, archers attacked him. They shot at him with hostility, but his bow remained steady. His strong arms stayed supple because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel, because of your father's God who helps you because of the Almighty who blesses you with blessings of the skies above, blessings of the deep springs below. 
blessings of the breast and womb. Your father's blessings are greater than the blessings of the ancient mountains, than the bounty of age-old hills. Let all these rest on the head of Joseph, on the brow of the prince among his brothers. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning, he devours the prey. In the evening, he divides the plunder. All these are the 12 tribes of Israel, and this is what their father said to them when he blessed them, giving each the blessing appropriate to him. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now, please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. This is the word of the Lord. Hello, good morning everybody. It's very good to be together. Thank you, Lisa, for reading for us. And so here we are, gathered together to worship our King, the Lord Jesus. But what kind of king do we want? What kind of king is Jesus? Do we want a, a, a powerful, a fierce, uh, incredible warrior king ready to fight for his people, ready to conquer sin and death? Or would we rather have a kind, gentle, generous friend, even a, a brother, welcoming someone who accepts his sinful siblings someone who promises good for them and that's a, a difficult choice isn't it because a fierce warrior who fights your enemies is a wonderful thing but that can be horrific if a fierce warrior turns on his own people in the same way gentleness and generosity precisely what we want in a dear brother but maybe not so much in a military commander. So what kind of king is Jesus? And what does the Joseph Judah story tell us about him? This is the last part of Genesis that we're reading, and the last part of the Joseph Judah story, which is all about how God redeems Judah, this uh, human trafficking, slave trading, adulterous, hypocritical monster redeemed. And also about how God exalts Joseph, uh, the, the hated brother, the imprisoned slave, and he becomes the king of a global superpower. And as we're at the, the end of this story, we're reaching the end of this generation, and we're starting to think about the future. What will God's promised blessing to Abraham do after this and part of that blessing to Abraham is that his family will be a royal family God told him that kings would come from him and so the question continues to be how is that going to work what's God's king going to be like in other words what does this story tell us about Jesus and so the first of 
two ideas. Jesus is Judah's physical descendant. Judah's physical descendant. This is chapter 49, uh, Jacob's blessings over his sons. Jacob's over 130 years old by now, and he calls his sons together to pass God's blessing on to them. Did you notice when it was being read that Joseph and Judah both get lots more words said to them about them than any of the other brothers? Some of them got only a single sentence. But Joseph and Judah, they get long blessings for them and for their families, which makes a lot of sense. Because this whole section has been about these two brothers, Joseph and Judah, about God's work in their lives. So what do we learn? What do we learn from Jacob's blessing over Judah? On page 55, verse 8 onwards, Judah, his family will be the royal family over God's nation. In verse 10, it says that the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. The king forever, the royal family forever. But what kind of king? What kind of royal family? Well, in verse 9, there it says that he will be a fierce, powerful lion, an incredible warrior, the conquering king. There's a reason why it is the the lion king and not the meerkat king. Fierce and conquering, strong and powerful. That's what Jacob says, what God says his king will be like. And if the image of a, a fierce, powerful king puts you off, as it may well do, let's remember what Judah is like. Let's remember his story. He was a monster at the start of this story. He was the brother who said to sell Jesus into slavery. He was a monster, but he's proved himself fit to be a king. Do you remember a few weeks ago in chapter 44 when he said he would rather sell himself into slavery than see his youngest brother taken away from their doting father. The powerful king, the lion, yes. But he uses his power for the good of the weakest and the most vulnerable. He puts himself into his brother's place to rescue him. And doesn't this remind us of Jesus? Doesn't this speak to us of how Jesus, the true lion of Judah, the fierce warrior of God, he uses his power and his ferocity to conquer death, to ransom us out of slavery to sin, to defeat the power of the grave, to free us from the power of fear. This is what God's king always does with his power. He helps his people who need rescue. He leads his siblings to safety and to blessing. He conquers sin and death for his people. Now, Judah has proved himself fit to be king because God has so transformed him, so redeemed him from whom he was. And and, and that's not all, uh, because this royal family is going to go through the son that he had through his abusive affair with his daughter-in-law, with Tamar. And the family that follows uh, is not full of sorted out and perfect people. Far from it. But where does this family lead? But to Jesus. So Jesus' family, Jesus' ancestors are not perfect. They're not good. They're not even morally neutral. This family tree is full of people like Judah, people like David and Solomon and and many others. To put it plainly, Jesus' family is full of sinners, people like you and me. So he chose to be born into this family. He chooses to love messed up and sinful people. 
and he redeems and transforms his family, just as he did with Judah. That's what he does with us, his adopted siblings who come to him by faith. There he is, our royal warrior older brother who fights our enemies for us. Jesus is Judah's physical descendant, the lion, the conquering king over sin and death. That is who Jesus is. Our first idea, Jesus is Judah's physical descendant, the powerful lion. Secondly, Jesus is Joseph's spiritual descendant. This is from the other passage we heard read on page 57, chapter 50. And this is from verse 15. Now, uh, just before this, Jacob, uh, the brother's father, he had, he had died, which is momentous. This is the end of a generation, a significant moment in the story of the Bible. But for these 12 brothers, and this is their dad. And if you've lost a parent then you might know how that can bring up all sorts of old memories and bad blood. And that's exactly what Joseph's brothers are afraid of. Look with me to verse 15. The brothers ask themselves, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? Now that dad's dead, what if Joseph's only been kind and generous to us out of fear and respect for dad after all he's the king of this superpower he's this incredible fierce king he could do anything to us so they go to him and say in verse 16 your father left these instructions before he died this is what you are to say to joseph i ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly Now, please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. And we don't know if Jacob did say anything like that. And I I do wonder if this is the brothers up to their old tricks, trying to pull a fast one. And it wouldn't be the first time. But what happens next? What Joseph does now is so wonderfully helpful for us in knowing what Jesus is like. After all, isn't this what we do when we confess our sins to him? We, the adopted siblings, coming to our king, the older brother, the one we abused and rejected, the one we thought was dead but now has been raised to life, that's raised to the highest place, that the mention of his name, every knee, should bow. We come to him, humble and lowly, knowing our weakness and our frailty, our past sins weighing us down, robbing us of joy and peace. So what does Joseph do? Think of his power. Think of his authority. Think of his righteousness and justice he could do anything he wanted to them and no one would be able to stop him so he cries in his compassion because he loves them so much And when they throw themselves at his feet and call themselves his slaves, well, he says this in verse 19. Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what's now being done, the the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. Joseph had over half of his life to think about what to say to his brothers. And if Joseph is as human as you and me, then 
I bet he rehearsed this scene in his head all the time. What we just read are prepared, thoughtful, considered words. Compassionate words. Forgiving and reassuring. And verse 20 there is famous. Many of us will have thought on these words before. God's sovereignty, the way that he can use human evil for his own divine good purposes. That is why Joseph can forgive, because of God's sovereignty. He almost goes as far as implying that his brothers weren't responsible for the evil they did because of God's plan. He almost does, but he doesn't quite go that far. But Joseph is so confident in God's power over all things that he can totally forgive his brothers, even after all these years, for everything they did. And isn't this so like our Lord Jesus? Our sinful attitudes wanted Jesus dead, just as Joseph's brothers wanted him dead, but God has turned that darkness into light, raising Jesus from the dead, just as he raised Joseph from slavery and imprisonment. Joseph could forgive his brothers because God, in his almighty love, redeemed their evil in his sovereignty. Jesus can forgive us, his adopted siblings, because God has redeemed our evil in his sovereignty. And so, the cross of Jesus, it does tell us about our evil, but it speaks a whole lot more loudly of God's forgiveness. And what is that forgiveness like? Well, what does Joseph say in verse 21? I will provide for you and your children. Now, compare that to what we can so easily call forgiveness in our world. Uh, Forgiveness, normally um, a kind of abandoning grudges and letting go of resentment, uh, choosing to move on in life, but only really to a place of neutral civility. That's normally how I think of human forgiveness. Uh, People have hurt me, and I've hurt them, but... I've chosen to be forgiving. And that normally means that I'm perfectly nice to them when I see them, but it's not like I'd ever reach out for a a serious conversation or invite them for dinner or uh, buy gifts for them. This is easy forgiveness. It says that I'm willing to move on, I'm willing to let go of the past, but not so much that I'll be vulnerable for you again. You don't get to be in a place where you can hurt me anymore. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. But what does Joseph say to his brothers? I'll provide for you and for your children. Everything I have is yours. Come into my house, enjoy my things. Come and live in the king's palace with me. I will give you everything you could possibly need or want. Don't be afraid. I'll provide for you and your children. You're still family. I still love you. I'll still give you honour and love despite the shame and hatred that you've given to me. Despite everything. Because God is good. And over a thousand years later, another king in Judah's family, the final king, Jesus, well, he says the same thing to us. Not just forgiveness, but abandoning revenge. And not just abandoning revenge, but making peace. And not just making peace, but promising to provide for his family. Because Jesus is kind and not just kind, but good, and not just good, but merciful. He doesn't hold us at arm's length, 
He welcomes us and loves us. Because Jesus is Joseph's spiritual descendant, the lamb, the one who forgives his sinful brothers because of God's goodness and sovereignty. That's who Jesus is. And so Jesus is Judah's uh, physical descendant and he's Joseph's spiritual descendant, the lion and the lamb. If you like, he's half Judah and half Joseph. The king of God's people, the conqueror, our redeemer, the one who saves us from sin and death. The gentle, compassionate, older brother who forgives our sins, the one who saves us from guilt and shame. That's who Jesus is, half Judah and half Joseph. He is very wonderful. And all of that means that all of us can come to Jesus. There's room for all of us in Jesus. He brings together both Judah's story and Joseph's story. So Jesus can redeem and transform sinners, just as he did with Judah. He doesn't forgive us to to hold us at arm's length. He transforms us and welcomes us and adores us and provides for us and gives us everything he possibly can. He has conquered sin and death for us. And so being forgiven by Jesus isn't static. It's the start of a journey of redemption and transformation and growth. He makes us fit to be his siblings, to be part of his royal family to be adopted co-inheritors of his eternal kingdom. He is glorious. And so Jesus is also the exalted victim of unjust suffering, just as Joseph was. And so as victims of suffering, we can come to him as well. We can come to him knowing that he knows what it's like. We know that he cares. We know that he understands how it feels. So we can live with confidence, knowing that just as Joseph and Jesus were vindicated and exalted, so will we be, despite how our lives may currently look. But also, and this is more difficult, we can learn to forgive. We can pray for the strength and confidence to forgive, just as Joseph did and Jesus does. We can learn to move beyond a worldly forgiveness to a much more wonderful divine one, learning how to forgive the people in our lives who have hurt us. Just like how Joseph was with his brothers, so Jesus is with us, kind and gentle, so compassionate and lovely. He is glorious. Jesus is half Judah and half Joseph, our victorious king, our forgiving brother, the lion and the lamb. And so he is ready for all of us to come to him, sinners and sufferers together, because that's what kind of king he is. He's not ashamed of us, he loves us, he calls us his siblings. And he wants us to enjoy him. He is very good. So shall we pray to our Father in his name together? Dear Father, almighty God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your redeeming, transforming power. Thank you for the incredible gentleness that you show to us. Thank you that you don't abandon us, but you forgive and transform us to be your people. Thank you that you've called us your own. Thank you that you've made us siblings with Jesus, adopting us as your children. You're so good to us, Heavenly Father. Amen.